Lockheed Martin's F-35 Joint Strike Fighter has been called a quarterback in the sky and the most capable tactical jet in history. But for all its stealth supercomputing power, the one label the F-35 just can't seem to get away from in recent months is failure. Now projected to exceed $1.6 trillion over the program's lifetime, a single F-35 costs the United States about $36,000 for every hour it's in the sky. That's about $14,000 more per hour than the F-16 it was intended to replace. The Joint Strike Fighter was meant to serve as a cost-effective solution to a number of problems. A single fighter that could meet the needs of three branches of the U.S. military, as well as foreign allies. Fielding one broadly capable fighter would mean streamlining logistics, reducing training costs, slashing development time, and increasing the interoperability between forces. Or at least that was the pitch. The reality that Lockheed Martin and the Pentagon soon came to realize was that asking for the impossible is always cost-effective. It's delivering it that can be pretty pricey. In recent months, a slew of bad press for the F-35 has once again made calling it a failure culturally in vogue. From largely fair criticisms of the aircraft's financial woes to newly announced tech issues causing strategic pauses in development, and even an apparent lack of confidence in the aircraft's affordability coming out of the Air Force's top brass, the Joint Strike Fighter program hasn't faced such an uphill battle since the Pentagon first decided it wanted a single platform that could hover like a Harrier, go supersonic like an Eagle, sneak past defenses like a Nighthawk, and land on carriers like a Super Hornet. The first studies that would lead to the Joint Strike Fighter or JSF program as we know it began in 1993 with America shopping for a short takeoff vertical landing fighter that could operate in the modern era. Soon, the Pentagon took notice of other fighter programs in development and posited a theory. If America could find one airplane that could replace a whole host of aging platforms, it would shrink acquisition costs, streamline maintenance and operational training, remove many of the logistical headaches tied to operating a large number of different aircraft in theater, and make everyone's day just that much easier and a bit less expensive. In hindsight, those goals weren't just naive. They really may have been the program's first major problem. Lockheed Martin, the same firm responsible for the world's first operational stealth aircraft, the F-117, and the world's first operational stealth fighter in the F-22 Raptor, would ultimately beat out Boeing for the Joint Strike Fighter contract thanks to their track record in the field of stealth and impressive technology demonstrators. Today, meeting the broad requirements of three American military branches and at least two foreign partners has been one of the F-35's biggest selling points for some time. But back in the 90s, it was akin to Kennedy's announcement that America would put a man on the moon within the next decade. It was a good idea on paper, but nobody really knew how to actually make it happen. Tom Burbage, Lockheed's general manager for the program between 2000 and 2013, said, and I quote, If you were to go back to the year 2000 and somebody said, I can build an airplane that is stealthy and has vertical takeoff and landing capabilities and can go supersonic, most people in the industry would have said that's impossible. The technology to bring all of that together into a single platform was beyond the reach of the industry at that time. But as we've seen time and time again with these sorts of programs, enough money has a way of making the impossible start to look improbable, and then, eventually, mundane. The Saturn V that kept Kennedy's promise about the moon was the most complex and powerful machine ever devised by man. And by Apollo 13, just NASA's third mission to the moon, the American people already thought the rocket's trip through space was too boring to watch at least until everything went wrong. Likewise, building a supersonic jet fighter that can hover over amphibious assault ships sounded pretty crazy. That is, right until the F-35 made it mundane. And that's why it's important to reiterate here that making the impossible seem normal costs a ton of money. In order to design a single aircraft that could replace at least five planes across multiple military forces, Lockheed Martin chose to devise three iterations of their new fighter. 
The F-35A would be the closest to what might be considered a traditional multi-role fighter, intended to take off and land on well-manicured airstrips found on military installations the world over. The second, dubbed the F-35B, would incorporate a directional jet nozzle and hidden fan to provide the aircraft with enough lift to hover and land vertically for use aboard Marine Corps amphibious assault ships or on austere, hastily cleared airstrips. Finally, a carrier-capable variant, dubbed the F-35C, would boast the greater wingspan necessary for lower-speed carrier landings, along with a reinforced fuselage that could withstand the incredible forces tied to serving aboard America's flattops. The plan was to leave as much about all three iterations as identical as possible, so parts, production, training, and maintenance could all be similar enough, regardless of the operating theater. But the best-laid plans of mice and men often go awry, and the F-35 was no exception. Todd Harrison, an aerospace expert with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, said, and I quote, It turns out, when you combine the requirements of the three services, what you end up with is the F-35, which is an aircraft that is, in many ways, suboptimal for what each of the services really want. Lockheed Martin's team of designers began with the simplest version, the landing strip-friendly F-35A. Once they were happy with the design, they moved on to the F-35B, which needed to house its internal fan right in the middle of the aircraft's fuselage. As soon as they began work on the B, it became clear that just copying and pasting the F-35A's design wasn't going to cut it. In fact, they were so far off the mark that it would take an additional 18 months and $6.2 billion dollars just to figure out how to make the F-35B work. Now, this was the first, but certainly not the last, time a problem like this would derail progress on the F-35. To some extent, these failures can largely be attributed to poor planning, but it's also important to remember that the F-35 program was aiming to do things no other fighter program had ever done before. Discovery and efficiency rarely walk hand in hand, and to make matters worse, Lockheed Martin had no real incentive to make the Joint Strike Fighter work on a budget. And that brings us to the two dirtiest words in modern military aviation. Concurrent development. You see, the U.S. knew that what they were asking Lockheed Martin to deliver wouldn't be easy. Stealth aircraft programs from the F-117 to today's B-21 Raider have all faced a struggled balance between price tag and capability, and with so many eggs in the F-35 basket, the stakes quickly ballooned. With highly capable fourth-generation fighters like Russia's Su-35 and China's J-10 already flying, and both nations developing their own stealth fighters by the 2000s, America was in a tough spot. The dogfighting Dynamo F-22 was canceled in 2011 after just 186 jets were built, making the F-35 the nation's only fighter program on the books. This new jet would need to be able to outcompete everything in the sky today and for decades to come, and it had to start doing it right away. To make this possible, the Pentagon believed the best approach would be concurrent development, or just concurrency, depending on the book you're reading. The premise behind concurrency is simple. You begin production of this new aircraft once the design is settled, and then you go back and make changes as testing highlights any issues that may need to be addressed. On paper, it looked like a way to begin fielding this new highly capable fighter, training pilots and maintainers, developing tactics, and settling it into service as it matured. In reality, however, it meant building F-35s before they'd been fully tested, and then spending billions to go back and fix them after testing revealed problems. And before long, issue after issue started bubbling to the surface. And they were serious enough that the Air Force began to consider just abandoning the first 108 F-35As they'd received, along with the $21.4 billion they'd spent on them, just because fixing them was prohibitively expensive. By the end of 2020, Lockheed Martin again postponed full-rate production, with a long list of issues that were still yet to be resolved. And amid all of this spending rose yet another financial hurdle— the immense cost of operating the F-35. While the Air Force's new non-stealth F-15EX might cost around $28,000 an hour to fly, 
The F-35 has cost at least $44,000 per hour for much of its life thus far. And each F-35 airframe is only rated to fly for less than a third of the total hours of an F-15EX. In other words, the F-35 has been egregiously expensive to develop and promises to stay egregiously expensive to operate. Not that long ago, General C.Q. Brown, the Secretary of the Air Force, even said that they would consider adding another cheaper fighter into the mix, despite planning to order more than 2,000 F-35s over its lifetime. The fact of the matter is, the F-35 is just too expensive to use for some jobs, and that's exactly what General Brown said. I'll quote him here. I want to moderate how much we're using those aircraft. You don't drive your Ferrari to work every day, you only drive it on Sundays. This is our high-end fighter. We want to make sure we don't use it all for the low-end fight. We don't want to burn up capability now and wish we had it later. But here's the twist. You see, it's easy to spiral down the acquisition rabbit hole until you start shaking your fist at the sky and any F-35s that may be in it. And if you view the world through the lens of dollars and cents, it makes sense to lump the F-35 in with flying aircraft carriers and pigeon-guided missiles as yet another mistake on Uncle Sam's bar tab. But these vantage points are missing one incredibly important bit of context. The opinion of the warfighters who actually fly these things. In terms of responsible spending, you'll really only see the F-35 program defended by the Air Force and Lockheed Martin's marketing team. But in terms of what matters in the fight, namely combat capability, you don't have to look far to find people singing the F-35's praises. But don't take my word for it, I've never flown one of these things, so we'll close with a quote from my buddy F-35 pilot Hazard Lee. Quote, If you separate the noise and talk to current fighter pilots who've flown with or against the F-35 in the last few years, they'll tell you the impact and value the jet has on the battlefield. This isn't theoretical or something that may happen in a few years. The transition has already occurred. The F-35, along with the F-22, is now the premier fighter aircraft in the world. And with that bit of trademark fighter pilot confidence ends yet another edition of Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by Sandbox News today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. Let me know what topic you want me to dive into next in the comments below, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.